probably the most famous friendship in literature, certainly the most famous in the Bible, is the friendship of David with Jonathan. But of course, friendship is a vital part of human experience, and it's described all through literature. Probably the most modern of the Christian writers who has written at some length upon friendship is C.S. Lewis, whose book, many of you may know, The Four Loves, has one quarter of it taken up with the love of friendship. He has some very interesting things to say, although some of his rather more chauvinistic male ideas I certainly would not want to commend to you and most certainly neither would my wife (laughs) who when I read some of C.S. Lewis to her this afternoon punctuated most sentences with oh It is an interesting section of that particular book, and I do commend it to you to be read warily. But what we are concerned with this evening is the biblical teaching on friendship, which we seek to understand particularly from the teaching that God gives to us in the example of David and Jonathan. There is no doubt that Scripture in various places gives us a great deal of wisdom on the whole question of friendship, especially in the book of Proverbs, and particularly perhaps in chapter 27, which could be an important place for you, to read as background to what we are saying this evening. Wisdom in friendships is the theme of that chapter by and large, and a great deal may be culled from it. But what both Old and New Testaments do is to raise the whole subject of friendship into a different world from the secular thinking which often directs our own ideas about friendship. It tells us not only that God gives friends to people like David and Jonathan in the Old Testament and to Paul in the New Testament if you think about people like Barnabas and Timothy and Titus who were God's gifts to him, not to speak of Luke, both physician and friend. It tells us also that God creates a relationship between himself and his people, which is a relationship of friendship par excellence. So Abraham is God's friend, as Isaiah assures us. And Moses is described in Exodus 33 as the one who communed with God face to face as a man communes with his friend. And the disciples discover this most remarkable thing that Jesus begins to teach them when he is in the last hours of his ministry in this world. I do not want you to think of yourselves as my servants only, he says. I have not called you servants. I have called you friends. The servant doesn't know what his master is doing, but the friend, by implication, does know. And I want you to be my friends, says Jesus. And you will be my friends if you do whatever 
I command you. Now this is the background against which we are to understand all the biblical teaching about friendship as we have been singing this evening. The greatest expression of true friendship, the model for it, is found in the way God makes us His friends and delights to enter into that relationship where we prove the glory of loyalty and love and faithfulness and inspiration and joy and intimacy in true God-centered, God-honoring and God-glorifying friendship. Now I want to speak about four things this evening as we think about the theme of friendship, and they are illustrated, I think, in David and Jonathan's relationship with each other. You will notice how it is described for us in uh, chapter 20 at the very end, in verse 42. Jonathan said to David, Go in peace. For we have sworn friendship with each other in the name of the Lord, saying, The Lord is witness between you and me and between your descendants and my descendants forever. Their friendship was covenanted in the presence of God, and God was witness both of its creation and of its nature. Now the things that I want us to identify and think about out of the lives and relationship of David and Jonathan are first the basis of biblical friendship, secondly the marks of it, thirdly the dangers inherent in it, and fourthly the blessings that are to be discovered in biblical friendships. Let me turn your attention first of all then this evening to the basis of friendship. There is no question that David and Jonathan illustrate for us what is true in every area of life where there are genuine biblical friendships. The basis of all friendship is mutual interest. And that is certainly true of David and Jonathan. If you notice in chapter 18 of First Samuel, after David had routed the Philistines and slain Goliath, there is a remarkable difference between the attitude of Saul to him and the attitude of Jonathan, Saul's son, to him. We looked last Sunday evening at the jealousy that riddled Saul's character and destroyed him ultimately as he looked at David and began to resent him as a rival, which is what jealousy effectively does. It resents rivals. But now in verse 1, notice after David had finished talking with Saul, Jonathan became one in spirit with David, and he loved him as he loved himself. Now, what was it that cemented that, that friendship? What was it that brought about that oneness? I have little doubt that it was a mutual shared interest. And you can see it if you look more carefully at David and Jonathan's lives. There is no question that what brought them together was that they were both military men. Not only so, they were both men of most remarkable courage and daring in battle. And just as Saul saw David's remarkable exploits against Goliath and the Philistines and was jealous of him. 
and wanted to destroy him as a rival, Jonathan looked at him and was saying to himself and to others, Isn't it glorious to see that kind of thing being done by God through such a man? And he rejoiced in it. His own spirit was joined to David's spirit because they were men of a similar ilk. You just need to look back to chapter 14 of 1 Samuel to see that. Chapter 14 of 1 Samuel is the account of the remarkable way in which Jonathan attacks the Philistines, almost giving a prelude to David's attacking the Philistines because there is only Jonathan, the son of Saul, and his armor-bearer. Listen to this in chapter 14, verse 1. One day Jonathan, son of Saul, said to the young man bearing his armor, Come, let's go over to the Philistine outposts on the other side. But he did not tell his father. Saul was staying on the outskirts of Gibeah under a pomegranate tree in Migron. With him were about 600 men, among whom was a who was wearing an ephod. He was a son of Ichabod's brother, Aitub, son of Phinehas, the son of Eli, the Lord's priest in Shiloh. No one was aware that Jonathan had left. On each side of the pass that Jonathan intended to cross to reach the Philistines' outpost was a cliff. One was called Bozes and the other Sine. One cliff stood to the north towards Michmash, the other to the south towards Geba. Jonathan said to his young armor-bearer, Come, let's go over to the outpost of those uncircumcised fellows. Perhaps the Lord will act in our behalf. Nothing can hinder the Lord from saving, whether by many or by few. Do all that you have in mind, his armor-bearer said. Go ahead, I am with you, heart and soul. Do you see how Jonathan has that capacity to draw the loyalty and the love of his armor-bearer? I am with you, he says, heart and soul. Now the rest of the story, exciting and thrilling as it is, is the story of how Jonathan and his armor-bearer, the two of them, destroyed the whole camp of the Philistines. It's as near an approach as you get in the Bible to an SAS operation. And they were men of that ilk. And that's one of the things that bound them together. As the armor bearer and Jonathan were at one heart and soul, so Jonathan and David found themselves bound together by the sharing of a common interest. Now that I have no doubt is what was the bonding element in Jonathan's friendship with David. He saw in him a man after his own heart. But it wasn't just the military business. It was not just this amazing daring and courage which they both delighted in. It was that they were both men who had a distinct and unusual confidence in God. We found at the beginning when we were looking at David's exploits against Goliath and the Philistines that the confidence of the young boy was not in his own armor of slings and stones or in Saul's armor which he declined to wear. His confidence was in the living God. The battle is not ours, he says. It's God's. And I rather think as Jonathan heard these words coming over the air, there was something caught in his own soul at the time. Because he says to his armor bearer, it is a small thing to God to save by many or by few. And the man had not only a shared interest of a purely secular sort. They had a shared soul. They were one in heart. They found their souls bonded together by the same attitude to the living God and the same love and confidence in Him. But I have no doubt that behind that, the forging of this friendship had a great deal to do with the providence of God in these men's lives. Being the son of Saul, Jonathan immediately was a man in need. 
because Saul was this pathetic, weak figure of a man who could not stand rivals. He was threatened by them, and Jonathan desperately needed someone to stand alongside him. In God's providence and grace, David became that man. David, in the history that God had prepared for him, with all the pressure that Saul was going to bring upon him, and all the danger that he was going to face, and all the loneliness that he was going to experience, he greatly needed a man who would stand alongside him, a man of common heart with himself, a man who shared his knowledge of and trust in God. And Jonathan became that man. And God provided for them both in a remarkable way. He provided for David, the crown prince who was Saul's own son, and made him David's friend. Now that's one of the many things which raised this friendship into a level of godliness, which takes it out of the realm into which such friendships are often placed in our modern society. It is our, a reflection on the society in which we live, you know, that the friendship of a man of David's caliber with a man of Jonathan's caliber is treated with suspicion. And we need to dismiss that for the sleazy-minded nonsense that it is and recognize that this was a God-given friendship and a God-given relationship. And at the center of it was God and their confident trust in Him and their common love for Him. And God still provides friendships of that kind today as many of us here would gladly be able to testify at crucial times in our lives, God has provided someone who is like a Jonathan to our David or like a David to our Jonathan. And we dare not, my dear friends, we dare not let a sick, rotten world get hold of this beautiful thing called biblical friendship and soil and destroy it. We need to redeem and sanctify the idea for the glory of God in modern life because there are many of us for whom it may be in God's gracious providence to provide such a friend. Let me then go on if that is the basis of friendship, a sharing of mutual interests, above all a sharing of the same heart for God and an awareness of the providence of God providing such a friendship. If that's the basis of it, what are the marks of biblical friendship? Well, the first thing I want to say is that it is not exclusive. Now, you may say, but Jonathan and David's friendship seems to have been precisely that. Here they are, two men who are singled out in their relationship with each other, and we read that Jonathan loved David as he loved himself. Well, I don't think the friendship was exclusive indeed there either because, as you well know, David was married while the friendship flourished. And he was not therefore exclusive in his friendship with Jonathan. But the important thing is that biblical friendship of this kind 
are not exclusive friendships. They are based on mutual interests. That is something that we share in common. And anybody else who shares these interests may be admitted to that friendship. That would be the common experience. And since this is the basis of that friendship, then it is not exclusive, you see. That's where it is different from a marriage relationship. A marriage relationship begins as a friendship and continues as a friendship afterwards, but it develops into something infinitely more than a friendship. While retaining friendship, I have more than one friend who has dedicated one of his books to his wife, my best friend. Good dedication. I know somebody else who says he's going to write in the dedication of his book to my wife, without whose help this book would have been finished years ago. <laughs> But that whole idea, you see, of friendship within marriage has to be distinguished so that the friendship and the marriage are seen as different things. Now, here is one of the places where I think C.S. Lewis is helpful. What Lewis says is two people who are in a marriage relationship are facing each other and are absorbed in each other. That is the kind of exclusive relationship where there are no rivals. But a friendship is not a relationship in which you are facing each other, you are standing side by side, facing the thing that has brought you together, the common interest, and others may join you. It is not exclusive. Now, the marriage relationship is something that remains exclusive. But if a husband and wife are true friends as well as being husband and wife, the friendship element in their marriage will be opened gladly to other people. Indeed, a marriage which turns in upon itself is often unhealthy. Where true friendship is still at the heart of married love, then that marriage will be open to other people in the world of friendship. You may know how difficult it can be for single people to discover those who have been married, excluding them now from their friendship. And it's an area where married people need to give a great deal of thought to the whole question of whether our friendship is not to be opened up to those with whom we would naturally and spiritually enter into quite deep friendships. But you see, this kind of friendship between David and Jonathan is not exclusive. It does not therefore contain the element of jealousy and resentment of other people. And you can see this in Paul's companions. They were all there together. He says, who is with me now? Well, there's him and there's him and there's him and him. And he has several companions together. They are differently gifted men. There are a number of women. 
They are a fellowship of friends surrounding the apostle and engaged with him in his ministry. And it's a gloriously beneficial thing in a mutual sense to all of them. Whenever you find that friendships become exclusive and where others are clearly turned away, that friendship becomes unhealthy. Notice the second thing which is closely allied to that, and that is that this friendship is unselfish. Notice verses 1 to 4 of chapter 18 of 1 Samuel. After David had finished talking with Saul, Jonathan became one in spirit with David, and he loved him as himself. That's one mark of the unselfishness. From that day Saul kept David with him and did not let him return to his father's house, and Jonathan made a covenant with David because he loved him as himself. Jonathan took off the robe he was wearing and gave it to David along with his tunic and, e and even his sword, his bow, and his belt. Now that was the insignia of his status as the crown prince that he was probably handing over to David. It was not that Jonathan was wanting to use David as some means to his own ends, he hands over to David the insignia of his position and gives him these gifts. You notice the same thing in chapter 20, verse 4. Jonathan said to David, whatever you want me to do, I'll do for you. Now, their friendship meant, you see, that Jonathan was delighted to serve his friend. It was an unfelt, unselfish form of friendship. Verse 42, Jonathan said to David, now this is after they have had to test out whether Saul is going to be coming for David again and wanting to destroy him, and they have discovered that that is indeed what is going to happen. And Jonathan does not say to David, well, stay, and we'll die together. What he says to David is, go in peace, for we have sworn friendship with each other in the name of the Lord, saying, The Lord is witness between you and me and between your descendants and my descendants forever. So go, he says. Go. Now, do you notice what selfish friendship would do? I tell you what this consuming, selfish friendship will, would do. It would say, Stay. You stay. I need you. You stay. But Jonathan's friendship with David says, you go. I'm more concerned about you than I am about myself. I know your safety is at stake, and I want you to go because we have covenanted friendship in the presence of the Lord, and friendship means unselfishness. So it is not exclusive. It is unselfish. Let me tell you about the third thing. It is unswervingly loyal and faithful. Look at chapter 20, verse 12. Then Jonathan said to David, By the Lord, the God of Israel, I will surely sound out my father by this time, the day after tomorrow. If he is favorably disposed towards you, will I not send you word and let you know? You can rely on me. That's what he's saying. David, he says, my brother, my friend, you can rely on me, come what may. But if my father is inclined to harm you, verse 13, may the Lord deal with me, be it ever so severely, if I do not let you know and send you away safely. May the Lord be with you as he has been with my father. 
but show me unfailing kindness. Now he says, that's my unfailing loyalty to you. Now he said, here is the unfailing loyalty I want from you. This should be seen in both sides of our friendship. Show me unfailing kindness like that of the Lord. Oh, did you get that little bit? Show me unfailing kindness like that of the Lord. Be like the Lord to me, David, says Jonathan. Oh, my dear friends, have you known what a friend like that is? Be like the Lord to me. Do for me what the Lord would do for me. Show me unfailing kindness like that of the Lord as long as I live, so that I may not be killed, and do not ever cut off your kindness from my family. Don't let it be a thing of the day. Not even when the Lord has cut off every one of David's enemies from the face of the earth. So Jonathan made a covenant with the house of David, saying, May the Lord call David's enemies to account. And Jonathan had David reaffirm his oath out of love for him because he loved him as he loved himself. This question of loyalty, my dear friends, in friendship is one of the great distinctives of biblical friendship. And you will remember that David maintained that loyalty to the end of the day, not just until Jonathan died. But after Jonathan died one day, there was a little boy who limped in his company. And they said, who is he? He is Mephibosheth, they said. An unfortunate name with which to land any child. But they said, his name is Mephibosheth. Well, now, said David, I want to be kind to Mephibosheth because he comes from the lineage of Saul and is the son of Jonathan. There's faithfulness for you. There's loyalty for you. This world in which we live, my dear friends, it knows very little about loyalty. It knows very little about loyalty between friends. Disloyalty is the pattern. Loyalty is the exception. I sometimes think as I overhear people being disloyal, not just about their friends, but about their own family, I cry sometimes, God in mercy, deliver us from that ghastly treachery that makes people speak disloyally of their own. David and Jonathan were loyal to one another. I want to say to you, too, that this true friendship is not only not exclusive and unselfish and unswervingly loyal and faithful, it is undemanding and realistic. That's the point of chapter 20 from verse 42 onwards. That moment when Jonathan says to David, Go in peace. We have sworn friendship with each other in the name of the Lord. You see, this friendship was not a friendship that Jonathan made a burden on David or David on Jonathan. What happened was that he was undemanding. He said, You go, you go. In the Lord's name, go, because I care more about you than I do about myself. And true friendship is always like that. And it is realistic. It is not allowed to override other relationships or other responsibilities. David, I say, was married to Michael. Saul's daughter, Jonathan's sister. And there were responsibilities that David had there, and the friendship had to allow for that. David had a destiny in the purpose of God. 
He was going to be king one day and Jonathan knew it and Jonathan says to him, you will be king one day and I will be second in your household. How undemanding he was because actually he was the legitimate heir, come to think of it. And David was the one who was coming in in his place. Let me say a word to you about the dangers of friendship. The basis, the marks, the dangers. I've just a little to say about that. You might be relieved to know. The very nature of true friendship is that loyalty and unselfish love are its essence. But that can sometimes be its pitfall. Listen to this from Proverbs chapter 27. Wounds from a friend can be trusted. I don't recognize that, you know, because I was brought up in the authorized version which says faithful are the wounds of a friend. Now, there was a time, you see, in 1 Samuel chapter 20, from verse 5 onwards, when Jonathan needed to learn that lesson. The wounds of a friend would be faithful. What was happening, you see, in the relationship between Jonathan and David was that David was sharing with him. They shared everything as friends would do. And David shared with him that it was highly likely that Saul, his father, was going to destroy him. And that the occasion might well be when he came to the king's supper table to dine. Just let me read you verse 5 of chapter 20. So David said, look, tomorrow is the new moon festival, and I'm supposed to dine with the king. But let me go and hide in the field until the evening of the day after tomorrow. Why did he want to hide and not go to this nosh-up? The reason was that he knew that Saul would be after his life. So what does he tell David to do? Verse 6. If your father misses me at all, tell him. David earnestly asked my permission to hurry off to Bethlehem, his hometown, because an annual sacrifice is being made there for his whole clan. Now, uh, to put it mildly, bluntly, and whatever, that was a fib. David was asking Jonathan, his friend, to lie for him to his father. Now, in, jo in Proverbs 27 and verse 17, the writer of Proverbs has this lovely thing to say, as iron sharpens iron, so one man sharpens another. You heard that before? As iron sharpens iron, you know how it happens if you have a knife and the iron sharpens the iron. As iron sharpens iron, so one man sharpens another. It means that one man in friendship has got an influence upon others. And especially if you are an influential leadership type character, you will have an influence on other people. But what I want to say to you this evening is that influence can either be good or bad. It can either be beneficial or it can be disastrous. And here, David's influence on Jonathan, his friend, is to turn the poor chap into an unwilling liar. 
And if you read the rest of the chapter, you'll learn that Jonathan did precisely that. There are dangers in this kind of friendship. They are the dangers of having influence on other people. And we need to ask ourselves and ask God, what kind of influences do I have on other people? Do I make it easier for them to love Christ, to obey Him and serve Him, to put Him universally first in every area of life? Do I make it easier for my friends to do that? Or instead of being a stepping stone to obedience, am I a stumbling block in their pathway? That's the point. There are dangers in friendships. Oh, but there are blessings. There are blessings, and the blessings are what I want to finish with this evening. 1 Samuel 23 and verse 15. Here is Saul pursuing David. And David is at Horesh in the wilderness of Ziph. And he learned that Saul had come out to take his life. That's verse 15 of chapter 23. And Saul's son Jonathan went to David at Horesh. Listen to what he did for him. He helped him to find strength in God. Jonathan helped David to find strength in God. It was almost as if he was a kind of a bridge, you know, from the crisis to the Lord. And he said to David, Be my guest, walk over me, to find strength in the Lord. I'll bring you to discover the glorious riches of His grace, David, that's the impact of our friendship on each other. And that's a very wonderful thing. Is that what our friendships do for one another? Do I make it easier for people to get to know God in all His glorious fullness? and to discover what his friendship can be in life. There are friendships that are like a reflection of the friendship we experience with Christ. And God only knows the impact of them. Robert Murray McShane writes of Andrew Bonner who served God up there in Finiston in great days. And Andrew Bonner and Robert Murray McShane and Horatius Bonner the hymn writer and William Chalmers Burns, they were friends in Christ. And Robert Murray McShane writes, Andrew Bonner is a great stimulus to Christ for me. That's what biblical friendship is all about. Being a stimulus to Christ for other people. Let's pray together. Father, we greatly long that you would make us such friends and give us such friendships in this place that the beauty of Jesus may be reflected in them for the glory of his name. Amen. Now let's sing together.
that great hymn number 155, which John Newton wrote, one there is above all others well deserves the name of friend, his is love beyond a brother's, costly, free, and knows no end. They who once his kindness prove, find it everlasting love. I thought we might miss out a verse, but I can't think of a verse we should miss out, so let's sing it all. 155 to the tune, Irbi, number 175, one there is above all others. 